Hi, I'm Bradley Rigney, and I'm a Project Management Technical Consultant here at Colmy Group. Today I'm going to be going over the reporting capabilities with the PlanView Adaptive Work PPM tool. PPM tools have become essential for organizations to effectively manage their projects, resources, and overall portfolio. While these tools offer a range of features, one crucial aspect that significantly contributes to their value is robust reporting capabilities. Reporting capabilities enable organizations to gain insights, make data-driven decisions, and improve overall project performance. This executive summary outlines the importance of reporting capabilities with the PPM tool and highlights their key benefits. AdaptiveWorks native reporting engine allows users to view key data in an intuitive way. In today's workshop, we're going to review AdaptiveWorks reporting module, identify the limitations within the module, highlight some financial reporting capabilities, and demonstrate an example of an executive dashboard. Now when we go into AdaptiveWorks reporting module, as seen here, you'll notice that there's several out-of-the-box reports that provide insight into many different areas. You can tell what's out of the box if it has a system generated check mark activated. If you want to refine your reports to be more tailored towards your specific needs, you can create your own reports. You can do this by starting with a blank slate or by using an existing report as a template. In order to save an existing project as a template, you simply need to highlight the selected project. In this case, we're going to be doing current projects. Click the edit button up here at the ribbon bar. And then once you're in the report editor, you'll notice there's a Save As button. If you click on Save As, it's going to automatically save a copy of the currently selected report, and it's going to automatically assign this name up here as copy of whatever the report name was. Now when you create a report, the most important question to answer is what data do you want to capture? You can capture data from up to three objects, and they must all be related to each other. These are called hops. You can see your hops here from your report on and your include related data menus. You can hop down from a project and then from a project you can report down to cases. And then from cases, let's report on action items. So you'll see that there's a hard limit at three hops. So you can never exceed more than three objects you're reporting on. And again, these must all be related to each other. It's very important to keep in mind when you're designing your project, where you want your hops to go to. If you start adding columns or graphs or highlights or anything else we're about to go over to your report and you realize you need to redo your hops, everything will reset to default. For an example, now that I've added these two additional hops onto our report, if I were to deselect action items, you'll get a pop-up message saying that it's going to reset all of your data. For that reason, it's recommended that you try to finalize and confirm your hop structure before you get too far along in your report. Now let's talk about some of the other information available at the top of this report. Every report must have a name in order to be created. Now you notice that since this is saved as a copy and it says copy of, that's the default name, but there's nothing to stop me from erasing the copy of and creating a project with the same name as the project that already existed. So there's no uniqueness enforced by the system when it comes to report names, but it's recommended that you try to make your report names as unique as possible and be descriptive. For instance, if I were to make this report on all active projects, I would maybe call this an all active project report. In addition to that, if you want to change your name and then also add a description, there's a description field available here, as well as a category if you'd like to add that as well. We're going to leave that blank for now and we're going to move on to one of the most important pieces of a report and that's the permissions control. Permissions dictate who can view, edit, or contribute to a report. These permissions can be either manually set here on the report. For instance, if I want to manually set my IT PMO group, we can see that I can select them here and I can assign them whatever permissions I'd like, viewer or editor. Now permissions can also be inherited from the folder. So if we go back to our list of reports, and we click on the folder itself for the report, there's a little down arrow. If we click on that arrow and we click on More Info, you'll see there's a permissions box on the folder itself. Now I've already added my IT PMO group here as a viewer, so any report that gets created in this folder is going to automatically have them assign viewer permissions. It's important to keep that in mind when you're creating projects inside of a folder. 
to make sure that the right users are inheriting the right permissions. Another important thing, speaking of folder permissions, is to make sure it's going to go in the correct folder. So you'll notice right underneath the name, you'll see a folder, and then you'll see the current folder that it's in, and you'll see the option to change it right here. So if you wanted to change the folder to either My Reports or possibly your Milestones, Financials, whatever folder you want, you can select that here. I do want to keep it in Project, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. Now another feature that I'd like to discuss is the scheduling option. Scheduling reports can be a really useful tool to automatically send reports on a predefined cadence. Now even though it's a very useful tool, it does have some limitations to it. So for starters, only admins and light administrators are able to actually schedule a report. The reason for that is because the scheduled report counts as a scheduled workflow rule, so it's going to consume a quota for your configurations, and because of that, only the admins and the light admins are able to schedule this. Another thing to note here is that when you set a preferred time for your cadence, only two reports are able to be sent out on each hour. So for instance, if I scheduled this report and an additional one to send at midnight, I wouldn't be able to schedule any other reports to schedule at this hour. They would have to be moved to either an hour after or some other time other than midnight. One more thing about the preferred time is that adaptive work doesn't recognize daylight savings. So if you're in a time zone and your organization is located in a time zone that recognizes daylight savings, be aware that when you schedule the report, it's going to go all over the standard time rather than daylight savings time. Now below our scheduling options, we also have the option to add tabs. You can see here that this report has two tabs already enabled. And the system won't stop you from creating quite a few more tabs. I don't believe there's a hard limit on how many it will let you add, but it's typically not recommended to exceed 10 tabs. The reason we recommend not to extend 10 tabs is because once you start to go over 10, the report is pulling in so much information that it kind of slows down how fast your report will process and can cause some latency issues. Now below here, we'll also talk about our highlights. Highlights can be added to a report right above the chart. Highlights are highly customizable, and if you click Edit on a highlight, You'll see that you can select whatever field you'd like, you can select what type of summary type you'd like to include, including a custom summary type. You can also change the name of the caption to be something different from the field you're actually displaying. And then you have some display options as far as custom CSS or conditional formatting. The biggest limitation with highlights is that you're only allowed to select three per tab. So that means we could add one more highlight here. and then we wouldn't have an option to add another one on this. If we're going to another tab, then your highlight limit resets, so you can have three per tab. Below our highlights, you'll see we have an option for charts. There's plenty of chart options here. You can do stacked charts, cluster charts, standard, bar charts, pie charts, line graphs, pretty much anything you need to report on and present in a chart, you can select here. Now, some of the limitations here comes on how you report your information. For instance, on the y-axis, you'll notice that by default, it's going to show the number of projects. So these two options here, number and percent of, are going to refer whatever your main object you're reporting on. So as a reminder for this report, we're reporting on the project. So by default, it's going to show number of projects and percent of projects. There's also an option here for sum of. So for reporting on related items, for instance, cases, we can click Sum of, and then we can select Case Fields that we would like to summarize. One thing you'll notice on these bar charts is there's no option for a percent of, only sum of. If we go over to a pie chart, though, we would be able to select percent of. So it's just a little limitation there on the charts. You can add your percent of, your related objects, onto your pie charts, but not your bar charts. And down at the bottom, this is where we'd put our columns. The columns are pretty self-explanatory. This is going to be the actual information from the projects or whatever object you're reporting on. You simply select what fields you'd like to report on and drag them over into this window on the right, and they'll show up on the table in your report. One quick thing to note here is that when you are reporting on related information, for instance, I'll jump into another report. 
This is a report I created, and I called it Project Status and Associated Cases. So the idea of this report is to report on a project name, the status, and then any associated cases, so requests, risks, or issues associated with that project. If I go to my columns here, you'll see that's exactly what I've put in my columns on the right. Project name, project status, project due date, and then you'll notice here that I jumped from the project to the related cases and included the title for those cases. Now if I run this report, you'll see that even though at the top it says I have three project results, you'll see that I have more than three line items displayed below. And that's because for test four, we have four separate cases associated with it. And since I'm reporting on that related item title, it's going to create four line items, one for each request associated with that project. Now to avoid this kind of duplication on your report, one workaround could be using our group buys. So if we go back into editing, you'll see an option for rows group by. This allows you to group the information in your table by certain parameters. You have your primary grouping, your secondary grouping, and then you can also do a third grouping as well. But again, there's a limit of three here for the grouping. So if we group by project name, that's going to sort out all of our related cases by the particular project they're related to. So if I save and run now, you'll see that all of my cases associated with my test four project are now underneath there. Likewise, you'll see the other cases associated with the other reports there as well. You also have the options to collapse and expand all, or you can click each individual one to collapse it or expand it as necessary. Another useful feature inside of AdaptiveWorks reporting engine is financial reporting. So you can report on a project and report their financial fields, or you can do what we see here, which is called time-phased financial reporting. Time-phased financial reporting allows you to see the real cost and revenue, as well as future projections shown in a time-phased format. So as you're going in and you're doing financial management on your projects and updating your forecast on a regular basis, you'll be able to see the reflected forecast in your time-phased reporting. One thing to note here is that if you're reporting on financials, all of these fields that you see here are not viewable unless the user is tagged as a financial user. This is a great out-of-the-box way to kind of prevent financials from being viewed by users that shouldn't have that permission. One thing to be careful of though, is some of the out of the box financial reports, they may have a highlight that is a custom highlight, meaning that it's taking financial fields but doing a custom formula on it. And the numbers that come out of that custom formula are not counted as financial fields. So you may wanna verify that those custom highlights on the out of the box reports aren't gonna be an issue for you. Now, if we look into our financial report here, you'll see that I'm reporting on the project and then financial resources. From there, I have an option for cross-tab mode since this is a, a time-phased reporting object, and so I've enabled my cross-tab mode. There's a date range as well. I've selected this year, but you'll see there's various options here. And then down at the bottom, you can select what information you want to report on. Now you'll see leading columns and cross-tab columns. You'll also notice a check mark by this rows group by. And if you go to change your grouping, you'll see this pop up at the bottom. It says group by a corresponding item ID field to allow leading columns. So by default, the system will put this item ID group by in there. And if you were to take it out, you would not be able to edit your leading columns. A leading column is going to be anything that relies on the project object itself. So our normal fields from a project. Whereas cross step columns, are going to be our time-phased information. So if we want to do time-phased data fields, here's where you could get your actual cost, your actual revenue, actual profit, and any of these other financial time-phased data fields. For this report, we're going to report on our forecast revenue and forecast cost. So going back to what our report looks like, you'll be able to see a month-by-month -month breakdown of the forecast re revenue and forecast cost, as well as a sum for each month 
and then a total field, so you can see the total for each project, and then a sum for all of the projects being reported on. Now again, as you go in and perform financial management on your projects and update your forecast, the projected numbers will be changing dynamically. So this is a great way to analyze historical behavior and performance, as well as analyze trends for the future. Now that we've looked at how to create your own reports, how to include financial information in your reports, now we want to look at how we could present that to an executive. So since all the information is coming from various places, we need a way to present all of them together outside of a single report. The way to do that is through dashboards. You'll notice on the report module you have the option for a new dashboard, but there is a system generated executive dashboard that we'll use as, as an example here. Dashboards allow you to display multiple reports, highlights, and charts into one place. This is a fantastic feature for executive reporting where executives may want to see data across a multitude of areas. So if we go into our Edit Dashboard button, we'll be able to see what's going on behind the scenes here. You'll see that each one of these panels, is, as they're called here, has a specific report to display, for instance, project revenues, and then you can also select a specific tab to display. From there, you can choose whether to display the table or the chart. You can also choose whether to show highlights or not. Keep in mind that once you select a project, you have to select at least one of these three options. For instance, if I deselect chart, it still has my show highlights selected. And if I toggle that off, it's going to default it to the table. So you must always have one of these three things on because you can't pull in a blank table into your dashboard. You also have options for editing the layout. You have an option for one column layout, two column layout, two even columns, three columns, and three even columns. This particular example is three columns, so you'll see two smaller columns on the left and the right side, and then one larger center column. You can add panels as you'd like, and you can add reports. Let's go ahead and pull in our current projects report that we were working on earlier. And you can select your tab select whether you want to show highlight, chart, or table, and then we can save and run. Because I added a new report into this dashboard, it's going to take some time for it to refresh. Note that dashboards do not automatically refresh every time you open them. Because it's pulling in information from so many reports, it can typically take a few minutes to load a full dashboard. For that reason, the dashboard will only refresh when you manually tell it to or if you set it on a scheduled refresh. So at the top here, we have a refresh button that any user can click on to refresh the dashboard at will. Or if we go back into our edit menu, you see here that we have an option for a scheduled refresh. In order to do this, you must add a running user. And it's going to be very similar to scheduling a report. Again, this is an admin only feature. So keep that in mind as well. Now, one more cool thing about AdaptiveWorks reporting tool so whether it's a dashboard or a report, if you need to share this with an executive who may not have a licensed user account inside of Adaptive Work, you can share these reports in a few different ways. You can export it as a PDF file, or you can share this as a widget. You can set a password if you choose so, or if your system setting requires it, but in our case, we're not going to set a password. You can set expiration date, you can choose whether to enable links and expose the refresh option. And then after you do all those things, you can click Next and you'll get a link. Any user can click on this link and they do not have to have an adaptive work license in order to view this information. You can select from users inside your system or you can put in a manual email address. Now let's do a quick recap of some of the limitations and capabilities we talked about today. We talked about how reports are limited to reporting on three related objects. We talked about how scheduled reports consume a business rule quota, and that can only be scheduled by an administrator or a light admin, and that's going to be limited to two per hour. We also recommend not to exceed more than 10 report tabs. 
We discussed how time-phased financial reporting can be used to view financial trends and forecasts. We went over dashboards and how we can bring in multiple reports to be displayed together on a single page for executive reporting. And we also talked about how to share reports and dashboards with non-licensed users using widgets. Reporting capabilities play a pivotal role in maximizing the value of a PPM tool. The ability to generate comprehensive reports empowers organizations to gain visibility, make data-driven decisions, foster collaboration, monitor performance, and meet compliance requirements. Implementing a PPM tool with robust reporting capabilities can significantly enhance project management practices, optimize resource utilization, and drive successful project outcomes. I hope this quick rundown of PlanView Adaptive Works reporting tool helped you see how it can be leveraged for financial and executive reporting, and as well as some of its limitations. Thanks for watching.